All right, welcome back everybody to the GT Industries channel. So in previous videos, we have covered a lot of automotive technology information. Uh, you know, we've gone through, we've programmed keys, we've done a few things with the radio and the auxiliary input. Um, this video and uh, the next few videos are going to focus on something a little bit different. We are gonna move or transition back into the world of IT. Um, now, we do have a video up on the channel already for how to install Proxmox 8.0, which I'll link in the description below. Uh, but what we're doing today is we are covering websites. One of the biggest questions I get is, hey, how do you not only build your own website, but how do you actually buy a website and how do you host that website for free? So there are two components, or well, there's more than two components, but let's just say for basics here, there are two components to a website. You have to have the actual domain itself, which is in this case, example.com, or what you'll see here in a little bit, uh, gtindustries.org or gtindustries.net. You actually have to own that domain. Now, there are free domains out there, um, or at least there were. I haven't seen a lot of them popping up lately because there are some issues with those free domain companies. Um, but I believe you still can technically get a free domain. Um, I just don't really look into it anymore because nobody really cares, especially at what prices domains are now. So you need to get a domain. You need to figure out what you want as a domain um, and then see if that's available and purchase that domain. Now, we'll go over those steps later on. Um, this first video is just going to be getting the basics set up for what you might want to do later on with that. Uh, but for today, I'm going to be showing you guys how to create a Docker uh, virtual machine or a virtual machine that hosts Docker desktop so you can actually visually see what's going on. Um, and we're also going to go through and get cloud panel set up so that you have a place to put your websites. So we'll go through and get those two things set up real quick. Um, but those are the essentials that you're gonna need along with a few other things that we'll cover in some other videos to get your own website up and going and hosting it. Um, but the first things that we're gonna do today is we are gonna set up two virtual machines, both running Ubuntu. Uh, and we're actually going to use the same server that we set up in the Proxmox 8.0 video. So you'll see up here, I have Proxmox Virtual Environment 8.0.4. And that is the server that we set up in our last tech video, our last IT video. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm actually just going to jump into it for you guys. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to download Ubuntu. So Basically, how you do that is you go to Ubuntu download, download Ubuntu desktop. And when you get in here, you can accept everything. And you'll see right here, Ubuntu 22.04.3 LTS. You'll want to download that image. And after you've downloaded that image, you're going to want to go in here and you're going to want to go to your local, uh, your local storage and whatever it is that you have that labeled as. And you're going to go into ISO images and you're going to go to upload. Now you're going to select your file and you're going to browse to that downloaded ISO image that you just downloaded from Ubuntu. You're going to name it if you want to rename it. You're going to leave everything else the same and then you're going to say upload. Once it's done uploading, you'll have it in here. As you can see, I have the Ubuntu 22.04.3 desktop AMD 64.iso. So this is the ISO image that we are going to use to build our virtual machines. We're going to build two of them. So let's go ahead and click back on your actual server itself, okay? And then you can go ahead and create a virtual machine up here in the top right, that create VM. I'm gonna leave everything the same. So I'm gonna you know, leave that as VM ID 100, and I'm gonna call this my Docker instance. So this is the label over here, if you see on the left-hand side where it says PVE1, imagine an a item directly below that that said Docker. This is that label. So you can name it Docker, you can name it Virtual Machine 1, you can name it Virtual Machine 100, or whatever you want to name it. Um, it doesn't really matter. And that is what you will see over here on this left hand side. Once you figure out your name, go ahead and click Next. Now you'll see there are various different things you can do in this window. This is your operating system window. So you can use a CD or DVD disk image or ISO file, which is what we're gonna be doing. You can use a physical CD drive if you have one passed through or hooked up to the host machine. 
and you don't have to use any media at all if you don't want to. Now, of course, we're going to be using the CD, DVD, disc image, so we're going to select our local storage. You may have additional options in here. Um, I have additional options on other servers for network storage, which uh, we will go over in a future video. Um, and then you can select your ISO image and you'll notice this one is five gigabytes. Um, again, this is the uploaded image that you uploaded into the server. This is not the one you downloaded um, onto your computer, uh, even though it technically still is because you did download it into your computer, but then you re-uploaded it to the server itself. Uh, so the server has that image available so it doesn't have to pull it from the internet or your computer or anything like that. Make sure your type is set to Linux and then your kernel is also set to six uh, plus basically. Once you have that selected, go ahead and click next. This is your graphics card, your firmware, your BIOS, all that. Um, go ahead and leave the default C BIOS. I will say under machine here, it may have accidentally switched it to Q35. If it did switch it to Q35, uh, switch it back to I440FX. Q35 is used for Windows machines. Um, and then of course the UEFI BIOS is also for the most part used for Windows machines. Now, under the SCSI controller or the SCSI controller, you can leave it um, with whatever you want. You'll see the default is LSI-53C-895A, which is right below it, 53C-895A. Um, now, I typically don't ever mess with that. There are reasons to mess with it, which we won't go over in this video, um, but you can leave it however it popped up for the most part. Under disk, this is where you're going to be selecting the storage for your device or for your system. I like to always change it to SATA. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. That's just me. Um, again, select your storage area, whether you have network storage or not. Select your size. I'm just going to say 100 gigabytes. And rather, it's actually gigabits, um, not gigabytes. Go ahead and check this discard button here. And one thing I haven't mentioned is you probably don't see all of these options on yours, uh, starting at general here. Um, make sure your advanced uh, button, whatever you want, checkbox, advanced checkbox is actually checked down here because if it's not, you won't see any of these advanced options. So go ahead and check that and make sure you're in the right place there um, and that you have everything. And under the hard drive, for SATA and your 100 gigabits, make sure you check discard and then also check SSD emulation. Uh, now, my system is running nothing but SSDs, uh, so I can do this. Now, I do want to warn you though, whatever storage medium you are using, if it is not SSD, um, I don't recommend using SSD emulation if it is a standard spinning disk drive. Uh, the reason for that is I have noticed some issues with it on at least my systems, um, and other people have reported the same issues where you may try to run something and it just runs unbelievably slow because it's attempting to, you know, emulate an SSD when there's not actually an SSD available uh, for it to be pulling information from or writing information to. So that is definitely something you want to make sure if you are going to turn that on that you do have an SSD wherever your local LVM storage is concerned or whatever storage path you're using. Go ahead and click next. Now we're going to go ahead and dedicate our sockets here. I'm just going to do four cores on one socket um, for a total of four cores. You can change this. Let's say if I did two sockets, meaning two CPUs, and each of them were four cores, if I did two here, you would see I would have a total of eight cores listed. Now, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and do one CPU socket and four cores, making a total of four cores altogether. Um, and personally, I like to change this to the host. I know they made all these other options, so you didn't choose host, but personally, that is my preference. I like to make sure that the host uh, is selected because we are doing VM systems and we are running Docker. And I have noticed if you don't have host selected on various things um, on these, at least on this page, on various things, you may run into issues when it comes to Docker virtualization uh, and getting things up and going. I ended up uh, having to find that out the hard way on a few of the things that I utilized in my systems. You may not utilize those same things, but it's always a good idea to just set that to host. Go ahead and click next. This is where you're gonna set your memory. So memory is a little tricky when it comes to how you want to uh, dedicate it. So you'll see this says 2048. That is 2048 uh, megabits of memory, which if you convert that is two gigabytes. Um, now the extra 48, is basically in bits. This is how you define RAM in bits. So right now we have two gigabytes. I would prefer 
to have eight gigabytes. So you can just take that 2048 number and multiply that by four, uh, and that gives you your eight gigabits or eight uh, megabits number, which is 8192 in my case. Now you can multiply that and, you know, by two and get 16 gigabits or whatever you want to do. Just make sure you calculate that correctly so you don't have some weird amount of RAM, like 1.9 gigabytes of RAM whenever you get into your system. Now, the next thing is minimum memory. The reason you have memory and minimum memory is for swapping. So it's always a good idea on especially Linux-based systems that if your Linux-based system is not going to use all of the RAM available to it, that you go ahead and let it send that RAM basically back to the host uh, for it to reallocate to other VMs that may use it. So you want to go ahead and select the minimum memory that you need, uh, which in this case would be half of um, half of what we currently have, which if you take 8192 and divide it by 2, you get 4096. So I'm going to set that to 4096, which is going to basically give me the ability to send four gigabytes of this back to the host. Um, you can also leave that as a default 2048 if you're okay with only having two gigabytes dedicated to it uh, at any given time, uh, which I am not. So I like to do 4096. I basically half whatever the RAM is. So if I had 16 gigabits in here or, or 16 gigabytes in here, um, I would put uh, the 8192 in this minimum memory spec here. That would allow eight of it to go back to the host when needed, and it would make sure that eight of it stayed uh, in the VM itself. Now, you can set that as a ballooning device, which allows it to expand or subtract as needed while the system is running. So go ahead and hit Next. Now we're going to go into our network devices. Most of this I always just leave uh, kind of blank or just let it kind of fill itself out. Um, except I do untick the firewall because I personally use an external firewall management system for Proxmox. Um, now, if you guys want, you can use the firewall on here. It just causes a little more issues when it comes to ports being passed through and things of that nature. Um, I always untick it because, like I said, uh, I use an external firewall management system. And it doesn't actually manage the firewalls on the VMs. Uh, it actually just manages the firewall information from the port that I have open on my router all the way in to the server itself, and that's about it, but that's more than enough for what I have going on. So, now that we have all that set up, we can go ahead and click Next, verify all of your information here, and click Finish. It's going to create a new virtual machine over here on the left. You'll see VMID 100 popped up, and you have to give it a second before it actually finishes allocating all the info, and there it goes. Now you see there's not a symbol next to it, and it says Docker. So we can go ahead and click on that and go into the console here, and we can actually start this system up. Now, we're going to start it up uh, for Ubuntu, and Ubuntu, if you know anything about Ubuntu, is that you can try it or install it um, under the same system or under the same menu. So let's go ahead and make this full screen here so you guys can see it better. There it goes. And all you really have to do is you have to just, you know, boot this up, put it in try or install mode, and then wait for it to actually boot up. And what you're going to see is you're going to be presented with a menu or a window rather that says, hey, do you want to try Ubuntu where you can try it as a live ISO? So when you click try, basically this menu will go away um, and you can use it as though it were a regular desktop system. And then when you reboot, it'll reboot back into the installer if you want to uh, and ask you again if you want to install it. Now, I'm going to go ahead and install it. That way I can go through the menu here with you. Obviously, I'm uh, going to use English for my keyboard layout. I always do the normal installation with the download updates while installing Ubuntu. That's just my personal preference. For some reason, it doesn't actually always install the updates. Um, you'll see here in a little bit we will have to update everything once we are done with that. Um, so I think it basically just downloads the minimum amount of updates for the actual image itself if there's anything needed. Um, I do always do erase disk and install Ubuntu. Um, you can go through here and, you know, allocate various amounts, or you can do a different installation, but this is just what I want to do.
go ahead and hit continue to let it know that you do want to do all that. Now you need to set your time zone. So my time zone is Chicago. Come on. Okay. Anyways, there we go. All right. Now, this is where you can enter all the information for the computer itself. So in this case, I'm going to enter Docker. We're going to do Docker PC1, I suppose, can be the computer's name. I don't know. And then this is for web hosting. So my username is going to be web hosting. Now I'm going to choose a generic password here. Enter it twice so you have everything set up. Go ahead and check login automatically, and you'll see why we do this later. But I do go ahead and check that so that it does log in automatically. And then click continue. All right, so we are back. Um, now I've gone ahead, I've done a few things uh, in the meantime, and I'll go through exactly what I've done here. So your screen will look a little different than this. Um, after the reboot, there is a message pop that pops up that says, please remove the installation media and press enter to reboot. Don't worry about that, just press enter. Um, there is no installation media to actually remove technically. So go ahead and just hit enter, it'll reboot. You'll get a couple things when you first get logged in, uh, which is just kind of the generic setup information that they want to know. Go through those prompts. Uh, it's like five or six prompts and then hit done. Then you get dropped into the desktop. Now, all I've done from that point forward to now is I have removed all the unneeded icons from the favorites bar here, and I've added the terminal to the favorites bar. So just click these little dots down here, type in terminal, and then right click on it and hit add to favorites. Now I already have mine in favorites, so that's why it says remove from favorites, but go ahead and just hit add to favorites there. And then once you have done that, you are good to go. We are both at the same place. So now let's go ahead and start off. And again, we're doing Docker on this one. Uh, so this is our web hosting username at our docker-pc1 PC. So the first thing I want to do, I want to do sudo apt update and and sudo apt upgrade dash y. Now, for those of you who don't know, sudo is the sudo command that is basically how you run things as a uh, administrator almost or a root user on ubuntu and other distributions of linux apt update is the command to update all the currently installed packages as well as get a list of installable packages the and and symbol is basically this saying go ahead and use root permissions to update the apt repository and then so you've got and then use the root permissions to upgrade the apt repository and yes i want to go ahead and upgrade everything uh you know it basically just says yes to all the prompts that you would get if you left that off so go ahead and we'll hit enter it's going to ask for our username password which we set earlier during installation. And now it's going to go through and update the various different packages, um, the list of packages, as well as install any updates uh, that are needed. All right, so we are done with that. Um, now I have gone ahead, I moved forward a little bit uh, just to make sure that we have everything needed. But the next thing that you guys are going to do is uh, you're going to go ahead and do sudo apt install. And then you're going to do open ssh dash server then dash y what this is going to do is it's going to install open ssh server and you'll see mine is already installed as you can see there and i can type clear and clear everything out uh, the reason we need this is because we are going to be setting up this system to be ssh um, to ssh into it from a windows system using putty now putty is a windows tool or a windows program or application whatever you want to call it um, that you can download and install, and it allows you to access the commands 
line or what people most likely refer to as the command line uh, from a Windows computer to a Linux machine or any other thing like that, basically. Uh, now, you know, we'll, we'll go through that a little later um, and show you why we're doing that. But basically, it's just easier to copy the commands from the Docker documentation into PuTTY, initiate those commands via PuTTY, and then, uh, you know, kind of go from there. So once you have OpenSSH server installed, the next thing you want to do is you want to do sudo passwd root. Now what this is doing is this is setting a password for the root user. Now I'm not going to do this because I don't want to use the root uh, account to log in via SSH. So I'm going to leave it as is for now. But this is if you wanted to use the root account to log in via SSH, you would do that. And then you would set the password and you would go from there. In fact, actually, you know what? I'll show you. We'll go ahead and do that. So go ahead and just set a random password or whatever you think you want. Whoops. There we go. Password updated successfully. So now I can go ahead and clear that. So now we have OpenSSH installed. We have our root user enabled. Okay. Now what we have to do is we have to do nano. And then etc, then ssh, then sshd underscore config. And what we're doing in here is basically going through and making it to where we can log in using the root information. So you'll see right here, it says permit root login, prohibit password. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and copy this and then... Control shift V space yes. Okay. And then control O to write out all the lines and then control X to quit. Now, if I go back into there, you'll see now I have permit root login set to yes. Okay. So that is everything that we need to do. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit reboot on this system. It's going to go ahead and go through and reboot. And then I'm going to pull up uh, putty here in a moment and I'm also going to pull up the docker documentation and I'll be switching back and forth between them uh, so you guys can see kind of not only what I'm seeing but also follow along with the links in the description as to what commands you need to paste in if you don't already know those commands so let me uh, go ahead and get that set up real quick and then we'll go from there all right so one thing I forgot to mention before starting this next section was that uh, in the virtual machine itself, open up a terminal window and type IP space A and then hit enter. And you'll need the IP address of your virtual machine. So 192.168.1.104 is the one for this one. And then now what we can do is we can switch over to PuTTY here. So if I enter that, 192.168.1.104, port 22 here. And I'm actually going to change my appearance a little bit, so let's change that real quick. Uh, we'll leave it at that. We'll set it to size font 20 bold so you guys can see it better. And then go back to session here, hit open, and there will be a window that pops up that says, uh, you know, asking if you want to accept. Go ahead and hit accept. Let me drag this over here. And now we are in PuTTY logged into, or rather connected to that system. So I'm going to show you guys if I log in with root here, you'll see it does work. I can log in with root. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll just go through uh, the entire installation and, you know, set it up on using the root account, basically. Um, now let's go ahead and let's switch over to the Docker desktop. Uh, documentation. So I'm going to go ahead and switch you guys over here. And you can see here that in the Docker desktop, uh, you know, installation documentation, essentially what all this is, it has various things that you can do. So make sure you've installed GNOME Terminal. Our Ubuntu instance already came with it. Uh, you know, if you've ever installed Docker before, go ahead and remove it. That's what these two commands are for. And then you have Docker desktop itself. So you can use the app repository or you can use the dev package preferably, um, you know, I like to use the Debian package to install it, um, but you still need to set up the uh, repository for Docker. So go ahead and open this tab. 
Now, you don't need to worry about any of this stuff for the most part, okay? Um, basically, what we're doing here is we are going through and installing the just the repository. That's it. It's just the information needed for Docker to run various system settings. So go ahead and copy this first box here. And then we're going to go back over to Putty here. And we're just going to paste that in. So all we're doing here is adding the app repository for Docker, okay? So we're going to go ahead and hit enter on that. It's going to run through. You're going to hit yes. You can also just hit enter. You don't have to actually put the Y there. Um, you'll notice the Y was capitalized on that, which means that it is the default. Now I'm going to go ahead and clear this window. And I like to personally clear the window after each time. Uh, and then let's go ahead and go back over to the documentation. Okay, so we've done this section here. We've... Uh, you know, we've set up the repository itself. Now what we need to do is install the Docker packages, okay? So this is the basically the Docker engine, all right? So I always do the latest. You can do a specific version if you really want to, but the latest is just what I typically use is the latest stable version. Uh, so this first command here is going to basically be installing the Docker engine using the repository we just set up. So go ahead and copy that command and then go back over to your PuTTY installation here, paste that in and hit enter. Again, it's gonna ask if you want to uh, continue. Now you'll notice the Y is capitalized, which means that is the default choice. So if I just hit enter here, it's going to say yes to that. So I went ahead and just hit enter and now it's going to go through and it's actually going to set up the Docker engine. This process can take some time depending on your system. You know, it may take as little as just a couple minutes or it may take as long as 15 or 20 minutes depending on how quick or not quick your system is. Um, I've seen it take as long as 20 minutes before and I don't really know what the difference is. I don't know if it's how often people are actually doing it or not. Um, but as you can see, that just took a few seconds and this system is a very low powered system, uh, you know, in comparison. So let's go back over the documentation here. Now that we've done everything, we can run the hello world command. So copy that command there and then go back over to putty here. I'm going to go ahead and clear this out real quick and then paste that sudo docker run hello world command in here. It's going to, it's not going to be able to find it locally. Okay. So you'll see, well, let's go through and, and I'll kind of explain what it's doing here. So unable to find image hello world latest locally. Basically, what it did is it looked for the latest version of that image, and we don't have it downloaded or didn't have it downloaded. So what it did is it went ahead and pulled that information down from the Internet. It shows you how much it, it downloaded, and then it shows you what it did with it right here. Okay, and then it runs it and it says, hello from Docker. This message shows that your installation appears to be working correctly. That's fantastic. Okay, so that is exactly what we wanted, at least for now. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. All right, so we've done everything we need to um, up to the point of downloading the latest Debian package. Uh, and the reason we're back on the server itself or what's going to be the server itself is because, quite frankly, I was having too many issues getting the package to actually download uh, using PuTTY. I kept getting errors for some reason. Um, so I'm just going to show you guys how to do it on the server itself. And we're going to kind of go from there. So. If you go into Firefox on the server itself, and it does take a second for it to open. And then search, uh, let's see, what's a good way to search it so you get to it the first time. Uh, let's just do a tutorial. How to install Docker Desktop on Ubuntu. Let's see, if, Yeah, there we go. All right, so takes you straight into that first link there. You'll see we have some of the original stuff and you'll see we have download the latest Debian package. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click that. It's going to open it up and then eventually here in just a moment, it's going to start downloading. You'll see it is downloading now Docker desktop version 4.25.1 uh, with architecture AMD 64.deb. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to let that finish. And then I'll show you guys, you'll see right below it is another command here. So we're going to go ahead and we're actually just going to copy that command. And I'm going to do the rest of this tutorial in the actual server itself using terminal. Uh, so we'll just kind of go from there. So let's change directory here. So we know that the file we just downloaded was downloaded to our downloads. So let's change directory to our downloads folder. Okay. 
and then list ls to list out the contents of that directory. And you'll see we have Docker Desktop 4.25.1 AMD 64 dev. So if I go in here and I paste in the command, whoops, there we go. All right, sudo apt-get install docker desktop version arch, blah, blah, blah. So basically what we're going to go in and do is we're going to swap out version with the 4.25.1 that we have above. And then we're going to swap out the arch, which is architecture, uh, for the AMD64, okay, dot .deb. And then I'm going to delete that little thing on the end there. So we have all together sudo app get install docker desktop 4.25.1 amd64.dev. And remember, we are in the downloads folder. So this should work. We're going to go ahead and hit enter. We're going to enter our password. If I didn't forget what I just typed for some reason. There we go. And it's going to ask you if you want to continue. Obviously, we do. And again, it is a capital Y, so we can just hit Enter. It's going to go through, and it's going to install Docker Desktop for us. Now, this isn't the only thing that we're going to need. However, this is the main component, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and let this run. It is going to take it several minutes to do this, um, and then we will come back whenever it is done. All right, so everything did as it was supposed to, so I'm going to go ahead and clear everything out. Okay, we are still in the downloads folder, just remember that. So I'm going to change directory back to our home folder here. And I'm going to do sudo apt, whoops, apt-get install, if I can spell it, docker-compose-plugin. Okay, so that is already in there. So fantastic. So now let's do, all right, docker dash compose, fantastic. Now we're gonna go ahead and, uh, so basically what I just did is I in, made sure that the docker compose plugin was installed. And then now I'm actually installing docker compose itself. The reason we're doing this is because we're gonna be using compose to create some YAML files or YML, YAML files uh, later on to launch various different software and programs. So I want you guys to make sure that we have everything installed that we need to. Again, this is asking if I want to continue here with the capital Y, we can go ahead and hit uh, enter. If it were a capital N, then it would mean that the capital, that the default answer is no. Um, whichever letter, whether it's Y or N is capitalized, that is the default, uh, you know, just to kind of cover that again. So it is a capital Y, so I'm going to hit enter here. It is going to go ahead and install the Docker Compose uh, software onto the computer here, and it is already done. It only takes a few seconds. Now we can go ahead and clear that out. So now we are done with the Docker desktop installation. I'm gonna go ahead and actually reboot the system here. So we're gonna go here and we're going to restart. Go ahead and hit yes. Now it's gonna go through and restart the system. And then once it boots back up, we'll kind of we'll open Docker Desktop. I'll set it up to where you guys can launch it automatically, and that's why we want to log in, um, is so we can launch Docker Desktop automatically. Uh, the reason we might want to do this is, you know, if you have various different things running, uh, let's say, oh, I don't know. Let's say you have, like we're gonna have later, Nginx Proxy Manager. Well, you don't want Docker to not start when the computer does. So let's go ahead and open a terminal here. All right, so now let's go with systemctl space dash dash user space enable space docker dash desktop. And basically what this is doing is this is telling the system to enable Docker Desktop to start for the current user when they log in. So we're gonna go ahead and hit enter. It's gonna go ahead and do what we need it to. We can clear and then we can reboot again. Now you'll see when we, re when we reboot this time, Docker Desktop is actually just gonna automatically start here in just a moment. Give it just a second to boot the actual virtual machine up. But it's actually gonna start immediately after logging in. And you'll see there it goes. It started, you can see up here in the right corner, there is a icon for it. So you can go ahead and hit accept on this. 
and then it's going to ask you some information. Now I'm going to continue without signing in. I'm also going to skip this and then you'll see we are now in the Docker desktop system here. Now, once you're in here, this is where you can run various containers and other things like that. So we're not going to worry about that right now, um, but I will go ahead and show you guys uh, later on in a different video how to install Nginx Proxy Manager and a few other systems as well. So that is it for this section of this video. Um, the next section is we're going to go back and create a virtual machine and install Cloud Panel on a secondary virtual machine. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so I have gone ahead and skipped forward a little bit. Um, you can see I now have a Cloud Panel virtual machine installed with the VM ID of 101 and the name of Cloud Panel. Um, I will go ahead and say you guys can follow the exact same steps that we did in the Docker installation. Uh, just make sure the VM ID is different than the Docker one and make sure the name is different than the Docker one uh, because obviously you don't want the same name for both ones because then you won't know what you're looking at. So go ahead and run through that, create that, um, that VM and then go through and install the uh, ISO. Once you've installed it and rebooted, you should see this screen. This is the screen that I skipped through earlier that I didn't show you guys. I figured I'd go ahead and show you guys on this one. Um, you can go ahead and not install thing, not install updates right now. Uh, so go ahead and skip this step if you want to. I always go ahead and skip the Ubuntu Pro and then no, I don't want to send my system info. Um, the reason I don't do that is because mainly I just don't want, you know, other entities knowing what it is that I have. Um, that's just my personal preference, though. And then, of course, privacy. I don't want, uh, you know, I don't care about a lot of this stuff. So I'm just going to go through and do that. And then I'm going to remove a bunch of these from my favorites because I don't need them. So let's go through and remove these. And then again, I'm going to type in terminal and then right click and add to favorites. All right, so we are basically gonna be doing the exact same thing we did on the other one. So let's go ahead and open up terminal. Now we're gonna do sudo apt install open ssh server. Go ahead and enter the password. I forgot to put Y on the end of that, so it's gonna ask me if I'm sure. I'm gonna hit enter to say yes, and it's gonna install the open ssh server. Now, I probably should have done an apt update and an apt upgrade before that, but that's okay. So I'll go ahead and do that um, after we finish this process. So let's do uh, nano, let's do nano, uh, etc, ssh, sshd underscore uh, config. And it is in the root directory, so I actually need to exit back out of this and uh, go back in and edit that as root. So sudo su dash. And now I can do nano etc ssh sshd underscore config. Go down here to where it says permit root login. Go ahead and copy this just like we did before. And then control O, enter, control X, and then exit and then go back to the non-root user here. All right, and now that we have changed it to allow root user access and we have installed the SSH server, now we need to do sudo passwd root, enter our new password. And that is done. Now we can go ahead and clear this out. And now we can do sudo apt update and and sudo apt upgrade dash y. Go ahead and let it run through its updates here. And then once it is done updating, we will come back and see where we get. Okay, so what we've done now is we have installed everything, we've updated everything, we've rebooted. Uh, now we are ready to actually install Cloud Panel onto the system. Now I know I didn't have it in full screen on the previous uh, on the previous section, so I went ahead I put it in full screen for you guys on this one. Um, now we're not going to be using all of these commands, so I'm just going to copy the um, you know 
I'm not even going to copy. I'm just going to do it separately. But we need to install curl, w, wget, and sudo, which sudo, I believe, is already installed. We've been using it. So curl, wget, and sudo. So let's open up a new terminal, and we're going to do sudo apt install curl wget dash y. Go ahead and put our info in here. It's going to go through, and it's going to install those two things. It's done. And if you really want to, you can do the um, sudo option as well. It's just going to tell you it's already done. So there's that. All right, and now what we need to do is go back to our documentation for Cloud Panel. And, of course, I'll link this in the description as well. And I'm going to install the MySQL 8. Uh, so I'm just going to basically do it in two sections, though. So I'm going to take this first curl command here, and I'm going to copy all the way down to C, to the dash C here. I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it into here. You'll see. All right, and hit Enter. And give it a second, and it was install.sh OK. Now what this did is if I open up my main folder here, it downloaded this install.sh file into our home directory for the current user, which is perfect. So we know that's there now, and now we can go back and we can do uh, sudo bash install.sh or whatever your name was. If you change the name of the file from install.sh to anything else, you'll need to change install.sh in this command to whatever that uh, new name is. So go ahead and paste that in there and hit enter. All right, so the installation has mostly completed here, and you'll see now it is actually installing the various language packages now. Um, so we're going to go ahead and let it finish installing those. This is a relatively quick process from here to the end of the installation. Uh, but after it installs the various language packages, if I forgot to disable it from going to sleep, that was my bad. All right, so now it's continuing here. I'm going to go ahead and let it keep going. And you'll see these green kind of banners or whatever, uh, letting you know that, hey, things are going the way they're supposed to. And then here at the end, in just a moment, you'll see it pop up with the information here. So the installation of Cloud Panel is complete. Cloud Panel can now be accessed on HTTPS. It gives you an IP address, and you are good to go. The problem is that is not the correct IP address. So that is your public IP address, which is why mine is blurred out. I don't want you guys knowing what the public IP address of the, t of the test site is. Um, so I've blurred mine out, but you will have whatever your public IP address is. So let's go ahead and clear the terminal here. Okay, now that we have cleared the terminal, uh, so what I'm going to show you guys next is how to actually access your Cloud Panel installation for the first time. So go ahead and do IP space A, hit enter, you'll see our IP address is 192.168.1.158, and I'll show you it can be accessed from a different computer. So we know it's 1.158, I'm going to go ahead and get out of full screen mode on this, go back to our Docker installation over here. And we'll go full screen on our Docker installation. We'll log into our Docker installation here. And we'll go ahead and minimize it and open up Firefox. Now, again, that was a 192.168.1.158. So we can go with HTTPS colon backslash backslash 192.168.1.158. Okay. And I believe it's colon 8443. 8443, I believe. Go ahead and hit advance, scroll down, and accept the risk and continue. And there you go. You are now in your Cloud Panel admin creation wizard. This is the first step in the Cloud Panel process. So we'll go ahead and put that information in here. So John Doe, let's do, uh, let's just do John Doe. Yeah, why not? And then. Jondo at uh, example.com. We'll do a password. And we'll make sure that the time zone is set correctly for Chicago. Let's find where that is. Chicago, I just saw it. There it is, Chicago. 
agree and create user. Uh, now you can save yours if you want, um, but I'm not gonna. So I already know what it is. So John Doe and then our password that we just set. No, don't save. All right, and now we are in. So we can look at our dashboard here, which gives us the various information things. Again, your public IP address is listed right here. And I will go ahead and be blurring that out as well. Your uh, PC name is listed right there also under sites. We don't have any sites yet, but Cloud Panel is up and running. You can access this from any computer within your network and you should be good to go. So that ends this particular tutorial. So we have gone through, we have set up not one, but two virtual machines, and we have set up Docker Desktop as well as Docker Compose in that first one. And we've also set up Cloud Panel in our second virtual machine. So we have all the basics ready to go for website hosting and creation. In the next video, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be continuing all that. We're gonna install uh, Nginx Proxy Manager. Uh, Nginx Proxy Manager is a uh, proxy service that uh, we'll, we'll explain it in the next video, but basically it's what allows you to host multiple websites, multiple servers, all within one network and have it all negotiated correctly when somebody uh, you know hits your website. We're also going to be creating a account for Cloud Panel, or I'm sorry, not Cloud Panel, uh, Cloudflare and going through the setup process of getting a website uh, purchased and all that. So that's all in the upcoming videos. So definitely stay tuned. And uh, we will be releasing those a little bit quicker than we have been our previous videos, just so you guys aren't waiting around for those and aren't having to, you know, kind of Google on your own if you're really wanting to do this right now. So those videos will be releasing in the next few days instead of a week from now, um, or they will be releasing a few days after one another. Uh, depending. So definitely stick around, stay tuned, and we look forward to seeing you guys there. Thanks so much for watching.